Let China have its own rule of law. What you read about reminds most of people of a training camp, of a training school. No, it reminds people it's of not concentration of a... camps. It is now law and order very much at stake in Hong Kong. China's recent celebrations for its 70th anniversary weren't quite the public relations triumph they were supposed to be. Not with continuing protests in Hong Kong and fresh revelations about human rights abuses in the Xinjiang region. My guest this week here in London is Victor Gao, a Chinese academic and lawyer and vice president of the Center for China and Globalization. How does he justify China's catalogue of human rights abuses and the continuing pressure on Hong Kong? Victor Gao, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you for having me. China has always insisted that it will do anything to avoid chaos. It shot a large number of its own people in Beijing 30 years ago to do that. But it's failed comprehensively to address the protests in Hong Kong. Why? Maintaining stability has always been a pillar for China's development since the late 1970s. But it's failed to do it in Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong is different ever since 1997. We're told it's part of China now. China has practiced a one country, two system. So in Hong Kong, the primary responsibility of maintaining law and order is resting on the shoulders of the Hong Kong ACR government and the chief executive, Carrie Lam. The Hong Kong government, that's approved by Beijing. Absolutely. Hong Kong is part of China and under the one country, two system. So it's doing system, Beijing's business. No, it's not doing, it, not doing it very well, is it? It's failed. It's failed uh, to keep the uh, hated extradition law, didn't it? It was forced to withdraw that. It tried threats, calling the demonstrators rampant and deranged and warning that a blow from the sword of law was waiting for them in the future. These threats had no effect. Well, I think there Does are... Does China not understand what it's dealing with in Hong Kong? I think there are many different ways to look at what's happening in Hong Kong. I would say the primary uh, situation right now is law enforcement. You are talking about restoration of law and order in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, democracy, of course, uh, when the British left Hong Kong in 1997, they did not leave behind a lot of democracy to uh, talk about. But the British did leave behind deeply entrenched the rule of law tradition, and I think we all need to be very grateful for that. And it is now law and order very much at stake in Hong Kong. We should not be confused with many other grievances and political pursuits in Hong Kong. They are important and they need to be dealt with, but law and order is the primary responsibility of the Hong Kong SAR government right now. But Victor Gao, look at the results of the local elections in November. Enormous blow to China's prestige. 22 years after the territory was handed over by Britain, the pro-democracy camp tripled its vote from 2015. They won 17 out of 18 councils, none of which they had previously won. Allow me to make several points. Uh, first of all, the district election result uh, speaks for itself. However, the district councils in Hong Kong cannot operate without stability. And if violence prevailed, none of the 18 district councils can really serve the primary purpose they are set up for. You're, you're, you're missing the point of my question, perhaps intentionally, I don't know. But the point is that this was the largest pro-Beijing party which was forced to declare defeat. For this major defeat, we said, we do not want to find any excuses and reasons. This was Starry Lee, chair of the largest pro-Beijing party. This is a big blow to China's prestige, isn't it? No, my reading is very different. Hong Kong is a democracy and uh, there is universal suffrage in Hong Kong for the people in Hong Kong for the uh, district council elections. Uh, therefore, the fact that the election results are such speak loudly for the fact that Hong Kong has democratic rights. People can vote whatever they want to do. Well, the results speak for themselves. Because none of the persons running for the district council had any courage to stand out for violence. They stood for legal and lawful means of exercising their democratic rights. I think that counts. So, so long as democrat, democratic rights are exercised peacefully and lawfully, everyone is a winner. 
no one is a loser. What we need to oppose in Hong Kong is violence. You, that is the key. You ignore the fact that China's plan has been to chip away at Hong Kong's freedoms and democracy until they were all meaningless and then Beijing could reassert full control. That's, no. been, the, that's been the plan, hasn't it? All I, along. Again, with due respect, I disagree. Why should Beijing or the central government in Hong Kong uh, uh, take away any liberties or freedoms in Hong Kong? But they did, no. they did Mr. Girl. Look, Why? like the kidnapping of five Hong Kong booksellers who just happened to turn up in mainland China, the crackdown on those who led the 2014 process, the highly controversial decision to allow mainland Chinese police to operate in the West Kowloon Station. All this is chipping away at the freedoms of Hong Kong. Did, did Beijing imagine that people wouldn't notice this? I think we need to really keep an eye on the big picture. That is, ever since 1997, Hong Kong has managed to keep its relative independence, judicial independence, for example, political system, there has been no change, etc. If you talk about specific cases, we can go into details if you have more time. Hey, look, let's deal with universal suffrage, because that's been most controversial. The refusal of the Hong Kong government to move towards universal suffrage for the chief executive position, as outlined in the basic law. Um, even after the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress in Beijing ruled that 2017 could see the start of universal suffrage for this position, the date came and went, so the promise hasn't happened, has it? And perhaps Beijing never intended that the promise should be fulfilled. And I think we need to be clear as to what we are talking about. Universal suffrage, no problem with that. You already have universal suffrage for the District Council election in Hong Kong, as we Which witnessed. Which you say doesn't amount to very much. No, it's meaningful. It's, it's very important. But you don't have it for the chief executive, despite the fact that it's promised it's in the basic law. Then again, allow me to mention, you are talking about universal suffrage or direct election of the chief executive. Exactly. Yeah. Does the United Kingdom have direct election for the Prime Minister? No. We're, we're, not not, we're talking about what's in the basic law for Hong Kong. Victor well, Gao, we're not talking about what, what things are like in Britain or in America or on Mars. You can play the what about game indefinitely. I'm talking about Hong Kong. What it said was, in, in, in the basic law, um, the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. And that didn't happen, did it? These questions are everywhere for everyone to see. The universal suffrage is not a problem. The election that the protesters are now demanding is a problem. Because why do you want to give Hong Kong something that neither the United States nor the United Kingdom have had for hundreds because of years? Because this is what they see that they were promised. Mr. Gao, right now, as you've pointed out, Hong Kong residents have freedom of the press, freedom of the internet, Absolutely. independent courts, multi-party elections even with, with the district councils. Does Beijing seriously think that by 2047 these people are ever going to willingly give up those freedoms? No, I think uh, the one country, two system uh, applies... Which comes to an end in 2047. ...applies only up to 2047. Now, remember when Deng Xiaoping was still alive and he was the key architect for the one country, two system, he said, for the record, that if the one country, two system will work out for the first 50 years, why couldn't it be extended for another 50 years? So there is an uncertainty as to what will happen in Hong Kong after 2047. I would say everything will come to an end if, for example, violence continues in Hong Kong. However, if stability, prosperity, development and the improvement of the people's living standards are the normal things all the way leading up to 2047, why couldn't the one country, two system applies well, no for ask, more years. It's no good for asking Hong Kong. me. You have to talk to the Beijing's leadership. But if 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 things don't go to Beijing's liking, and I'm sure they're not too pleased about the protests and the demands for freedom and the demands for China to live up to its promises and its international obligations, um, do you think that people are going to accept life in China, crushing level of censorship? what the UN High Commission for Human Rights recently called a context of increasing limitation on fundamental rights in China. You think people in Hong Kong will ever accept that? 
allow me to mention one point. You know,、uh, putting Hong Kong in the overall magnitude and the scale of China, whatever bad things that have happened in Hong Kong over the past six months, is, about bad things in China is, is 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 at the best can be called a storm in a teacup. It's not going to change. Meaningfully, anything that's happening in People's Republic of China at all. What Beijing is unhappy about and adamantly is opposed to is the violence in Hong Kong. Let's be honest and straightforward with it. No country, either Britain or the United States, will tolerate the level of violence that has engulfed Hong Kong for the past six months. No country. At what no point、governments. does China step in and stop it? At what point does it step in and stop it? Well, let's be philosophical about it. If you read the Basic Law, the primary responsibility of maintaining law and order rests with the Hong Kong ASEAN government. Yes, I、If、know. Beijing fail, approved government. Yes, it's endorsed and mandated by the Basic Law. My point is, though, that if China fully takes over control of Hong Kong in 2047, and Thinks so little of human rights as the UN says it does. Do you really expect the people of Hong Kong to embrace the kind of life you have in China? I mean, the legal obligations and commitments, the multiple laws, decrees, and policies,、um, in particular those concerning national security and terrorism, which the UN says deeply erode the foundations for the viable social, economic, and political development of society. You think after having the freedoms that they have in Hong Kong, they're going to accept that kind of life from China? Let's be honest about it. China is in firm control of the situation in Hong Kong as far as sovereignty is concerned. No one in the world can really second this, second guess this point, or really take Hong Kong away from China. That's for the record. Let's do not second guess about that. Of course, under one country, two system, Hong Kong keeps its political system in Hong Kong, the capitalist system. But do you think anyone will realistically expect that Hong Kong can be misused as a stronghold against China? No. Either today or in the, the day,、I、all、asked. the way to 2047. Mr. Gao, you're not answering the question I asked, which is whether you, Beijing imagines Hong Kong would ever accept the kind of restrictions that Beijing imposes on its own people on the mainland. After 2047, China has full discretion to decide what kind of political system will prevail in Hong Kong. What, what no would one... the people of Hong Kong get in return for being? Subsumed into China, a chance to be spied on by what Human Rights Watch called one of the world's most intrusive mass surveillance systems. Whatever happens will happen in Hong Kong after 2047. Therefore, China's record of of arbitrary detention, torture, and violations of right to a fair trial. You really think the people of Hong Kong are saying, "Gosh, I need some of that in my life." No, I'm、I、really think, looking forward to that. I think in today's world we should be very objective. And I'm biased about China. Let's look at how China is developing. Let's look at China lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Let's look at how Hong Kong has benefited tremendously over the past 22 years after、uh, being part of the one country two system. After China re-exercised its sovereignty over Hong Kong, let's talk I think this is the negative. Let's talk about censorship, Mr. Gao. In, in, in an interview earlier in the year, you called it unfortunate. Censorship in China. You said, hopefully, eventually there will be less censorship, leading towards no censorship at all. And I hope there'll be a day when people in China can freely watch foreign broadcasters. That's a pretty forlorn hope, isn't it? When you consider that 400 million extra CCTV cameras are going online, and the unprecedented. Degree of intrusion by the state into people's lives that we're seeing. Things are not moving in the direction you hoped for, are they? What you quoted was my view earlier this year. It is still my view today, and I think it will remain my view for the rest of my life. But it's a less, forlorn hope, isn't it? Things are no, going this way. No, less censorship may be good. However, every society has its own sensitive issues to censor about. 
Look at the United States. They censor a lot of things that the people here in Britain do not care about. In Britain, you censor other things. In Israel, they here, censor here we, other here things. Here we go. You're talking about Every all the other countries. Let's, let's just stay with China. You admitted this. You said the monitoring of social behavior of people in China does exist. There are quite a few aspects of that which I personally do not like. Yeah. Is the detention of around a million Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, one of the aspects that you don't personally like? I visited Xinjiang many times. I have many uh, Uyghur friends, Islamic friends in China. I didn't ask you that. I deal with them as brothers and sisters. I think to really ask responsible questions about Xinjiang, we need to know the spread of terrorism and uh, separatism and uh, extremism uh, in Xinjiang. There hasn't been any terrorism in Xinjiang for the last four years. Why? Because, because of what the government because did. Because you've locked up people without rights and without recourse and without any redress and without the ability to challenge their own incarceration. You think that's a good way of doing things? We're, we're, we're talking about the detention in so-called training centers, which were first denied and then finally admitted by Beijing last year. The UN says people were sent there under the guise of counter-terrorism and de-extremism policies, which you've just mentioned, and amid extensive limitations on the exercise of fundamental rights in Xinjiang. Are you proud of that? Let me uh, make a point. Terrorism just do not come out of the vacuum. Terrorism is the result of a process. And the process is very much dominated by indoctrination and uh, extremism, for example. In Xinjiang, there is no denying there is an increasing level of uh, radicalization. Many families actually deny their kids the right to education, which in China is considered as an offense or a crime. No one in China has any right to deprive their kids Mr. the Gao, right to go to school. Mr. It's Gao, happening the UN in Hong Kong. is expressing concerns about increasing practices of arbitrary detention, enforced disappearance, absence of judicial oversight, and restrictions on the right to freedom of expression, freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Quite a list isn't it? Quite a list. Also the right to freedom of assembly and movement within what it calls an increasingly securitized environment. This is a catalogue of rights to which your government has formally signed up in, in binding international treaties and which it is now violating wholesale. And I'm asking you whether you're proud of all that. Two points. Uh, first of all, the United Nations, generally speaking, is in line with what China has been doing over the past four decades or so. It's there not in line with the treatment in Xinjiang, as you well know. More than 50 countries in the world support what the Chinese government is doing in Xinjiang in dealing with terrorism, uh, extremism, and separatism. More than 50 of your separatism. client states who are hardly beacons of human rights. Let's, Many of which let, are Muslim let's, countries. Let's, let's, let's be honest about Many this. Many of these countries are Islamic and countries, Muslim countries. Many of them are your client countries. states. Are you proud that the UN China had to remind no you? China has no client state at all in the world. No, really. You're proud that the UN had to remind you that you have an obligation to respect and protect individual rights under the Universal Declaration? Absolutely. Human rights are very, you, very important. Yeah, why do you think All they're reminding the countries... you of your international obligations? Because you're violating them wholesale in Xinjiang. No, if you put it in international context, the United Nations keeps reminding the United States and many other developed countries of the rights that they fail to give to their people. That's on a routine we're basis. Not talking, we're not talking about the US. I know you want to evade it. I know it's embarrassing It's not invasion. You. you cannot talk You're about this in isolation yes, as can. if that's... We, we can absolutely talk about what China is doing in Xinjiang in isolations. Mr. Gao, one of the requests for information submitted to Beijing last month by 12 UN human rights rapporteurs was, was this. Please provide detailed information on the judicial oversight and control exercised by judges over persons placed in re-education facilities following charges under the counter-terrorism law. Let me make a bet with you. This request is never going to be answered by Beijing, is it? Let's do this. I hope with my help and with other people's help, you can do an interview in Xinjiang. I can help you to arrange some of these. You're interviews. not answering my question. It's not, not because going, I think Beijing is not going to answer this because there's no judicial oversight over the million or so Uyghurs in detention. Most of the inmates have neither been charged with nor convicted of any crime nor been given any chance to challenge their incarceration, as I said earlier. And no. that's fair? And you're happy with all that? No, I think you misquote the situation. 
Radicalization is a process at different stages of radicalization. You need to come up with strategies to de-radicalize the population in Xinjiang, including, for example, what I emphasized for the record, denying any family's misbehavior of depriving their kids the right to go to school. Thanks to leaked documents and despite considerable attempts at secrecy by Beijing, we now have massive amounts of detail about what these institutions are doing, including a leaked manual for officials running and operating these places. One of the documents that was released described detailed controls on each individual. The students should have a fixed bed position, a fixed queue position, a fixed classroom seat and fixed station during skills work, strictly forbidden to be changed. You like this kind of repression? You support this kind of repression? You may call it repression or you may call it uh, educational or training school teaching methods. If you go to a cadet school, for example, if you train for the UK military, you need to exercise oh, a lot on, of disciplines about that. Oh, come on, it's hardly comparable, Mr. Gao. We've also seen Beijing's instruction to officials in these camps. Implement behavioral norms and discipline requirements for getting up, roll call, washing, going to the toilet, organizing and housekeeping, eating, studying, sleeping, closing the door, and so forth. You trying to build robots in Xinjiang? No, what you read about reminds most of people of a training camp, of a training no, school. No, it reminds people it's of not concentration of camps, no, Mr. Gao. It no. reminds people of concentration camps. What will serve China to concentrate people up to, let's say, in using your number, one million or two million. This is not a concentration camp. As far as, based on my personal knowledge of my dealings with the Uyghurs, brothers and sisters in Xinjiang, this is not what you are describing about. You are violating... This is a far cry from reality in Xinjiang. It, not, not according to the evidence seen by the UN and democratic governments around the world. These camps let's call them concentration camps, they violate all basic rights and freedoms belonging to human beings under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which you are supposed to abide by. No, I would say let China fight its war against terrorism, let the British fight your war against uh, terrorism, and let's don't confuse terrorism, extremism, and separatism with what you would call human rights or and democracy. Even, even if one accepted your pretext, you have taken away every right that these have. You have illegally incarcerated these people without trial and without any chance for them to challenge that incarceration. That is illegal. No, I would and and say, that doesn't meet your international obligations. Sir, I would say you are imposing your view of rule of law onto China. Let China have its own rule of law this and deal with its law. own offenses at its, as it see fits. We are not talking about Britain. We are not talking about U the United States. We are talking about a sovereign government with legal rights to deal with the threats of terrorism and extremism We're and talking radicalization. About That's the key in China. No one in China wants to be a victim of terrorism. Mr. Gao, you're locking up people. According to the documents, you're locking up people who harbor vague understandings, negative attitudes, or even feelings of resistance, carry out education transformation to ensure that results achieved. That's the instruction that Beijing gives. You're looking at people who harbor vague understandings. That's all they've ever done wrong. And for that, you put them in one of these camps and throw away the key. So and you, you think, And you think that's OK. I, I think a lot of people, including the UN and human rights organizations, believe that you have forfeited the right to be a civilized country. So you are quoting something as if it is from the Bible. No, this is not sacred things. This may not be verified already using your standard of journalism. I hope you'll be realistic. It's, 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 it's been validated by considerably more eminent people than journalists. I hope you will really verify this with you your me it's not own true? journalistic standard. You're telling me it's not true? I don't think it is true, because what China is faced with is terrorism, radicalization, and separatism and extremism. That's the menace in China which is also faced by many other countries in the world. Look at the bombing here in London. Look at the terrorist attack against innocent people. You really want to have this kind of terrorist tendencies prevail in your country or in Europe? 
We have a common common task to do and you, to get and you united like, against the terrorism. And That's a challenge not faced by China alone. That's a challenge faced by mankind as a whole. You're a lawyer, Mr. Gan. Yes. You're even a lawyer who's licensed to practice in New York. Absolutely. And you think I'm proud this of that. kind of behavior by your government is acceptable. That's remarkable. No, I think the litmus test is to put an end to terrorism. That's the key. No one should by second guess by China's right. Human rights wholesale. That's what you say. You want congratulations for that? That's not in that? line with the reality on the ground. Protecting you have no shame about these conditions. Listen, people are kept. protecting no human shame. rights. Listen, protecting human rights will always be the most important thing as promoting democracy. But on the other hand, fighting terrorism and extremism is equally important in China as well as in UK or anywhere else in the world. That's the bottom line. We need to work together to fight against terrorism. Victor Gao, thanks for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you for having me.